Nice to see you. Thank you for being at Bible study or tuning in to see what we talked about at Bible study. We entered into the book of Numbers today. It's named the book of Numbers because at the beginning they do the great census of all the tribes. And then they set up how the camp is going to be ordered. That happens in the first 10 chapters of the book of Numbers. But before we got there, we talked about the inconsistencies that we find, particularly within the law, and how there can be inconsistencies between uh, a law in uh, Exodus uh, and a law in Leviticus, or a law in Numbers, or later we'll see a law in Deuteronomy. And so we looked at that using as our an ex example the slaughter of animals. Deuteronomy 12, verse 15 says, Yet whenever you decide desire, you may slaughter and eat meat within any of your towns, according to the blessing that the Lord your God has given you. The unclean and the clean may eat it as they would a gazelle or a deer. Now that contrasts to the Leviticus law, chapter 17, verse 3 through 4. If anyone in the house of Israel slaughters an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp or slaughters it outside the camp and does not bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting, to present it as an offering to the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, he shall be held guilty of bloodshed. He has shed blood, and he shall be cut off from his people. Very different point of view. And so the question is, how did that happen? What were the editors thinking here? Which takes us to uh, a theory called the documentary hypothesis developed in Germany uh, around... I don't know exactly when, maybe the 20th century, maybe uh, end of the 19th century in Germany, where they asked the question, why are these inconsistencies or these odd editorials? My favorite one is in the book of Genesis uh, with Noah, where he sends out the raven uh, to see if the flood has dried up and the raven's arm uh, not arms, wings uh, dry up the water. And then it sort of disappears, that whole storyline. It's just really weird little sentence there. And then he has the whole story of the dove going out and coming back and going out and getting the olive branch and coming back and then disappearing. And so you, you ask yourself, why are those two things squashed together? And um, and what we, we know now is that there are different authors at different times. So there's a story that was developed in around 950. And, and the author uh, of that early, early text is called the Yahwehist, uh, the J author. And next in about 850, you have the Elohimist, uh, which is the E author. And those two had a lot of influence over the book of Genesis. Later on, you have the Deuteronomist in 600 BC, and then the Priestly or the P author in 500 BC, and later the R author in 400 BC. And all of these stories, they have a new line of reasoning, and then they set it sort of just right up next to uh, within the context of the old stories. Uh, and in there, there's, there's tension. There's different ways of seeing things. And the beauty of this is it honors uh, what has happened and what is happening. The example I gave of that is the Christian community, right? We see that every time a new way of looking at Christianity pops up, the old one doesn't go away. So we have the Orthodox Church that split with the Roman Church in 1048. The Roman Church came into being uh, centered in Rome with their own theology and theology and uh, ecclesiology, and the Orthodox Church remained. And then the Protestant Reformation happened, uh, and there was a split between uh, the new Christian uh, protesting church and the Roman Church uh, and the Anglican Church and other branches. And and things come into being, but the old thing doesn't go away. It's true with our text. And the thing that's so important about this is if we had one monolithic way of thinking about things, the most important thing would be how other people are doing things, how this person is abiding by the laws that we have. But because we have a piece of scripture there in which there's so much tension, 
in the tension is the conversation, in the tension is the relationship, right? Not as dogma, as the one way of doing things, but as the nuanced ways of doing things, right? And in the tension, we grow more insightful about our own context, the context of our next door neighbor with whom we're in the conversation and the history and the tradition. So we started there and we talked about those different authors and those different things. The other thing you brought up uh, is that when this idea of documentary hypothesis came and the whole uh, reduction of the text to different authors and sort of slicing and splicing, it was a movement that lived in relationship with what was going on in the culture at large. Science was at, a, uh, at the stage of reducting everything down, right? to the very smallest denominator. If we could take a human being and get down to its essential parts, we understand how it works. That was the idea. And of course, the theologians thought if that works in science and everybody's like all hot on science, then maybe we should do it uh, with our Holy Scripture. And so they started to splice and dice to try to gain greater insight by dividing it in, into its um, uh, individual pieces and parts. Of course, that doesn't necessarily give you greater insight, uh, but it was an interesting exercise to give us um, a sense of why things uh, work weirdly together or, or seem to have uh, two things that are completely disconnected bumping up against each other. I also said that today, theologians, myself included, are completely enamored by quantum mechanics and artificial intelligence and the large language models and all robots and all of these other things uh, we are thinking about theology in the context of these things today. And in 25 years, someone will look back at the things I've written and they will say, oh, look at it. it was just like doing what was hot and popular and interesting and, and trying to understand God in relationship to this new thing. That is true. Nothing wrong with it. Maybe we'll gain some interesting insights along the way. Speaking of which, the book of Numbers, back to it. So uh, when I moments ago, uh, we have Moses, we have the the tribes, the numbering of the tribes, the sentences, sen the census uh, taking place, and then they start moving around. And when they start moving around, we see that there's all sorts of conflict and challenge to leadership. We have in chapter 11, the complaining about the manna. They're tired of manna. They want meat. And so uh, Moses uh, turns to the Lord. And the interesting thing about Moses is when, uh, for the most part, when people are complaining uh, and rebelling against him, he turns to God, falls on his face, and seeks to be in conversation with God. Not with the rebels necessarily, but God first and always God, and negotiating uh, passionately on behalf of the rebels, even if they are seeking to kill him or throw him out of power. It's very interesting. He holds God accountable for the covenant that God made with the people. So uh, they want meat. It's a grass is always greener on the other side of the manna, right? They have manna. That's pretty good. Free food every single day. Uh, they want something else. God gives them quails, more quails than they can eat, quails that they choke on uh, in their gluttony. Uh, some of them die of that consumption. Next, we find Miriam and Aaron complaining uh, about Moses's authority and unique position, even though they have very important roles to play. A uh, student in the class today uh, in her own research, which is always great, um, addition to the class, talked about how Miriam was seen as a prophet, Aaron as the priest, Moses as the one in communion with God and how they all worked together for the benefit of the congregation. So anyway, they get into this uh, disagreement. Miriam is cast out uh, with leprosy, but is cured and comes back into uh, the community. Uh, in chapter 16, we look at uh, the rebellion led by uh, Quran, Datham, and Ibrahim. Uh, and they're saying, look at everybody's holy, Moses, not just you. Everybody's included in God's kingdom and not just you. And Moses says, well, we'll see. And the next morning, uh, these three leaders, uh, Koran, Dothan, and Abraham, are 
sucked into uh, a big hole in the ground and earthquake comes and takes them away. Now, the question is, were they really seeking um, uh, a common equity in the theology or were they uh, seeking power on, unto themselves? It seems God thought the latter in that case. Uh, finally, we looked at the waters of Meribah. And we and we looked very closely. Let's look at this, uh, chapter twenty, and and ways in which we read the text, and and how the text tells us something. So the beginning of chapter twenty, I'm reading it out of the Bible here. We have uh, in Numbers the Israelites, the whole congregation came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed at Kadesh. Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation. Uh, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. It's very interesting. Right next to one another are this idea of Miriam dying and there being no water. Something shifted. There was, there was a, a, a relational or power shift that took place. And Moses apparently was angry. God said, uh, I can lead you to water. Speak to the rock. Moses goes to the rock, takes the staff of authority, right? The staff of Aaron, the staff that turned uh, into an almond bearing branch, and whacked the rock twice. Water came forth. And God said, I will not allow you to go into the Holy Land because you disobeyed. Moses made the water come out of the rock when God said, I can do it through your word. Moses didn't trust God. That's where we ended uh, with the book of Numbers. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for being part of this review. Uh, and we hope to see you soon. Peace upon your soul.